welcome to this very um, special lecture this evening. Um, my name's Heather Doran. I'm, I'm the Public Engagement Manager from the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science. Um, I'm just here to give a few safety announcements before we get started. Um, if the fire alarm does sound, please treat it as a real fire alarm. Um, and the best way to exit is by the way you came in through the doors and down the stairs. And we have a number of people who will be wearing high vis vests to escort you out of the building as well. Please note as well that this um, event this evening is being broadcast live as well. We've got a number of people joining us in the virtual audience um, who hopefully can see us and hear us fine. Um, so that should be fine and it's being recorded as well. But that does mean that the online audience will be able to pick up any um, questions and the sound collection in this room is really, really good. So they might be able to hear conversations. So um, <laughs> that's just uh, to let you all know that. <laughs> but we'll, we'll stop the live stream when that finishes. At the end of the event, we're going to be hosting um, a small reception just outside so please do join us for that and um, so that's all I got to got to say just now was going to have a number of people joining us this evening um, and the first person I'm going to hand over to is our principal of the University of Dundee um, Ian Gillespie thank you well hello everybody um, uh, so I guess there are uh, two things I want to say before I begin one is it's a forensics conversation. So um, uh, the microphones are on, conversations can be heard. There's nothing insidious in this, but it is a forensics conversation. So I want you to remember that uh, uh, these forensics chaps do actually take these things seriously. Um, the second thing I want to say is this is a week of, um, well, it's really a celebration because this is graduation week. Uh, here in Dundee. We've got seven graduation ceremonies this week. Um, we've just finished graduation ceremony number three. So I really want to pay tribute to everybody that's that's come along here because, you know, David and I were just discussing just now, uh, although the conversation we're about to have is incredibly exciting and, and important, there are other attractions on campus. So you're the guys that get the gold star for interest in actually uh, uh, taking forward an understanding of, well, actually reason and risk. Because that's what David's uh, uh, focused so much of, of his work on, on understanding risk, presenting risk, uh, doing that across a range of different uh, uh, areas and a number of inquiries. Uh, uh, from a popular perspective as well as from a scientific perspective. And David, uh, uh, I reflect on uh, many years ago, um, more than probably either of us care to remember, uh, I used to work in the Cabinet Office, in the Office of Science and Technology, and there was, there was a minister at the time under the last Tory government before Blair came along called Ian Taylor. And Ian Taylor was really interested in risk. In fact, what he said is to me, he said, Gillespie, what we need is a Richter scale of risk. And I said, well, you know, Minister, nobody actually understands the Richter scale as a logarithmic uh, uh, assessment. And uh, by the way, nobody still understands the Richter scale as a logarithmic assessment. So we look at fracking uh, and the impact of a bus going past. They're about the same. Buses have more impact. Uh, so how are we going to present risk through this Richter? And I know it's completely the right answer. So I think, David, you know, what, what you spent a lot of your career doing in communicating that risk to the layperson, but also to not the layperson, but somebody in different disciplines, to the judiciary uh, uh, and others, has been incredibly, incredibly important. I know that you've you've given a lot of evidence over um, uh, uh, many inquiries about uh, understanding uncertainty, understanding evidence. Um, the Harold Shipton inquiry, for example, plus a list of others. I'm not going to read them all out. This is vital to what we're trying to do here in Dundee. So we have the Leverhulme Centre uh, for Forensic Science. Uh, it's a, a £10 million investment and like all investments, it's one that lasts for a certain amount of time and then we need to uh, look at how do we continue it. But what the centre is trying to do is take a an interdisciplinary and, dare I say, naive disruptive approach to thinking about how is evidence, how is forensic science in particular presented to the judiciary and aiding in uh, decision making. And David, 
there is no one that's better able to contextualize some of this than uh, uh, you are. So, um, I think you all know who, who you're here to uh, listen to, but um, the Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, do, do I have to give all your um, uh, your accolades? I mean, you know, so one of our colleagues, Dario Alessi, is Dario here? No, it's so one of our colleagues, Dario Alessi, who, who's an outstanding um, uh, a scientist in our biological sciences. He was awarded uh, an OBE in the King's Honours uh, past weekend. And I sent Dario a note saying, Dario, it's absolutely fantastic, you got an OBE. Um, let me take you out for dinner. And he said to me, well, you know what, Ian, I don't think an OBE is worth a dinner for the principal. It's not that important. But an FRS is. Um, and the rest. Uh, David, you've been recognised by uh, so much of, of, of society in the United Kingdom. I'm absolutely delighted that we've got the opportunity to honour you with an honorary degree that you're about to uh, uh, come and be well, a centre of attraction and a joyous occasion at our graduation ceremony for. But tonight, uh, I think what we're looking for is your insight, your knowledge, your experience um, around that analytical space and how do we present evidence uh, in a way that is understandable, uh, that is uh, statistically viable and that is genuinely, genuinely scientific in, in driving uh, decision making. So it's a delight for me personally, but also for the Lever Hume uh, Centre for Forensic Science to welcome you here to give us this lecture. So David, please over to you. Thank you very much for that kind uh, welcome. It's very, very um, gratifying to be here and I can't wait to become a doctor of law tomorrow. I can't just, these are lawyers' hands, you know, just waiting for it. And thank you all for coming along. It's such a beautiful evening. It's lovely to be here back here in the land of the midnight sun. This is what it feels like in the middle of June. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk, uh, I suppose, about forensic statistics about the use of statistics to try to work out what's gone on because public inquiries which is what i'm mainly going to be talking about are all to do with going over past events and so rather than a sort of forensics that you know Neves center tends to look at which are you know some deeply unpleasant bits of stuff left over from unpleasant events i'm just going to look at use data to try to work out what's gone on so um uh -huh. Oh, I can see that. That's good. Cool. I'd like to give um, credit to acknowledge, you know, my collaborators on this. People from this wonderful Forensic Science Centre in in Dundee. People in North Northumbria Law School that we've been working on with. People in Cambridge and numerous collaborators on public inquiries who will become clear. Um, just a bit of background for me. I used to do statistical methodology, do sort of proper maths. I was, I see that. I, so, that was, uh, we were working on uncertainty in artificial intelligence in the 1980s. The first conference on uncertainty in artificial intelligence, which I went to, was in 1986. We worked away and I think we pretty well solved it. Now, unfortunately, things like GPT come along, which are brilliant. I got it on my phone, I use it all the time. Is absolutely no idea about uncertainty. Everything is delivered with enormous confidence, which may be completely wrong. So all the stuff we did, well, as far as I can see, is completely wasted. Never mind, we'll see. Um, I'm sure that we might come back to it. And I did all this analytic stuff and everything. And then I was really lucky, you've been talking about this, to change direction 15 years ago when I got philanthropic funding from a nice friendly billionaire. Find a friendly billionaire to give you lots of money and then you can do what you want. So since then I changed what I did. You know, I started making TV programs on climate change with Hannah Fry, Tales You Win. That was, oh, that was an interesting one. I see that now I can't go into all this now. There was a great story. This is about the dangers of burnt toast, you know, the acrylamide debate. And there was this campaign about you shouldn't burn your roast potatoes, which incensed me. I mean, who wants a soggy roast potato? You know, I really, I follow Delia's recipe. I make sure they're crisp. And then suddenly the Food Standards Agency was saying we shouldn't burn our roast potatoes. So I did the sums and worked out that in order to uh, reach a level of acrylamide that might possibly be dangerous for a mouse, you'd have to eat that much toast every single day. 
and the BBC very very nicely provided me with that much toast. <laughs> I did I didn't make that all myself. Oh, and, and I did um, uh, winter wipeout as well, and been over the big red balls as Professor Risk. So you just see how changing a career from a rather dull academic line, to what, what it can bring you into. And I've written some books which have gone quite well. OK, now, OK, we've been hearing a lot about this one, the COVID inquiry, uh, which is going on at the moment, which is really looking quite fun. I mean, I got fed up with it because they're already spending a vast amount of money on lawyers. Oh, God, I shouldn't say that. Should I? I'm about to be one. Um, but. <laughs> But they really are. They, this is going to be outrageously expensive. These public inquiries absolutely suck money into lawyers' pockets. Um, and um, I, I, I've actually been asked to contribute uh, reports to this, and I'm not going to do it. I, because as you can see from what I'm going to say, these end up being a huge amount of work. But these are based on statutory public inquiries. What I haven't had is a section nine. Everyone dreads the section nine because these public inquiries um, set up on the Inquiries Act 2005 have enormously strong legal powers. They can compel witnesses to give evidence and turn up. And that's the section nine order. All the people appearing at the moment in there don't want to be there. They have been asked for a section nine order and then you have to provide your evidence and turn up to give it. They've got enormous legal powers you know, frightening. And then core participants, which are various people involved with an interest like COVID uh, survivors groups and things like that, um, have entitlements to see the evidence beforehand and to, uh, and to not ask the questions directly, but to get the, what's now the KC of the inquiry, to ask questions on their behalf. Um, wh when you're a witness to these inquiries, you're not cross-examined. It's not a, a to and fro. It's an inquisition. Sometimes that inquisition can be quite gentle. Which is, I think mine have been fairly gentle. Sometimes they obviously they can be quite aggressive as the COVID inquiry has been. They cost a fortune. They cost an absolute fortune. Um, this is the one I've just actually I haven't finished yet. It's going on. It's, it still hasn't finished. The infected blood inquiry, which you may know about. This is to do with the fact that in the 70s and 80s, um, there, there were blood um, products particularly those given to people with haemophilia and other blood, blood disorders, um, were contaminated with both HIV and hepatitis, um, both because they were mass buying um, blood from America, which was donated in prisons, but also because very nice, generous blood donors in the UK included some injecting drug, drug users who were, and other high risk individuals, men over sex with men, who were, unknowingly effect, infected with hepatitis C or, or HIV. So tens of thousands of people got infected. Um, and we were we had to give an estimate how many people were infected and how many people have died because of it. And this is a great gang, this expert group, which includes some of the top names in infectious diseases. So they set this up before the pandemic and then pretty well all of them then went off to work on the pandemic. Graham Medley was a major player in all the pandemic modeling and Crystal Donnelly working at Imperial. So and but then afterwards, after the pandemic, everyone was so exhausted. So I got dragged in with some others to finish off this report. Now, that's a, a, actually it's quite good print, so you probably can see. This is the kind of thing we produced. So this was the, well, they, they asked the question, how many people with bleeding disorders, so this is, um, you know, with usually haemophilia, were infected with HIV through blood products in the UK between 1970 and 1991. Now, this is incredibly important. These, this is, these are terrible cases. A lot of kids getting HIV with haemophilia. And the, it, what happens typically is that there's lots of different sources of information. So for this, we had three three registries were there, none of which had spoken to each other, which was quite good, in fact, because it meant you had independent counts. You had the registry of the people who had been claimants for HIV. You had a registry of people who were registered with the Haemophilia Association, with the Doctors Association, and those which were registered with the, which was um, uh, HSE, Health and, Health and um, you know, well, it's gone through so many names, it's untrue. Um, UK, not HSE, it was a PHE. Before that, it was something or other else. I've forgotten what it was. Anyway, it's now it's UK HSA. So there's a, there's a registry of everybody, all the HIV infections in the country. And they all came up with roughly the same story, about 1,200 people had been concluded. So that was quite, quite good that we could conclude that. We did a lot more work besides, but basically we said, yeah, about 1,200 people were infected through blood samples. 
Notice the line at the bottom, the confidence that the available evidence can answer the question was moderate to high. So this is an innovation that we introduced, but which is becoming increasingly common, that people will make an estimate, make a judgment of a number, often with some uncertainty, we'll see at the moment about them, and then say, well, how confident are we that the evidence can even answer the question? Have we been asked an impossible question? So for example, we were asked how many people got infected with hepatitis B, and we said we cannot say. We got low confidence in any analysis. We refused to put a number. And this was being copied by various in IPCC and climate change. You see this all the time in SAGE when they're giving advice to the government. They did it all the time. A lot of use of this now to give confidence in the underlying evidence. Something uh, and, and uh, there is a fixed scale for confidence that's now becoming established, used, used widely, which I again, I've been trying to argue for that use in forensic science. Now, the point about HIV infections you can count them. But when we were asked about how many people got hepatitis C from blood transfusion, so these are people, women after childbirth, people after road accidents, people with surgery, having heart surgery, just having a transfusion, getting hepatitis C through their transfusion. We don't know. We cannot count them. There's no registry. Many of them will be wandering around and don't know they've got hepatitis C. I say to anybody, if you know anyone who had an operation or had a blood transfusion in the 70s or 80s, you know, and they're older, as particularly if they start getting any sort of liver problems, you must get tested for hepatitis C. Many will know it. So you have to build a model. So we had to build a great big mathematical model. Rather than counting people, we just had to estimate these invisible people. We don't know who they are. And we had to look at what proportion of, um, you know, estimate what proportion of blood donations were infected with hepatitis C. For that, we had to estimate how many how many people who uh, were infected, men who have sex with men or, um, uh, or in, you know, injecting drug users, ex-injected drug users, were blood donors. How many were affected? And the number of units transfused. So we, then we work out how many people might have received it, then how many survived, then how many have died, and how many have died because of hepatitis C. So this is all a great big mathematical model with huge amounts of uncertainty. Very not, not very satisfying at all, but that's all we could do. And there's a need for judgment. Can you remember the AIDS Don't Die of Ignorance campaign for those who back around in the 1980s, the tombstone, and these apocalyptic adverts? Well, that was around about the 1980s. The, the, this is when, when HIV started becoming, you know, um, being seen as a, a big issue. Um, it was before there was any possibility of testing for hepatitis C. That didn't come in until 1991. So all that time, there was HIV around in the 1980s and no testing for hepatitis C. But they did, in the mid-1980s, they, they did start giving guidance that if you are a high-risk case, not to prevent hepatitis C, but to prevent HIV, if you um, were a man of sex with men or an intravenous drug user, maybe you shouldn't you shouldn't give blood. And but what effect did this guidance have in reducing the amount of blood that was given by people? So we asked experts for their judgments about did this reduce it by about two thirds of the change in guidance? But then, and, and this is the, the reason why you need to be interdisciplinary. This is the reason why you have to talk to people about your data why you have to do actually talk to experts who are around. These people are all retired now. And when you ask them, they say there was a perverse incentive for high risk people to give blood in the 1980s because you could get an HIV test without having to go to a special clinic. So far from, and then they, if they got a negative HIV test, they gave blood, but they could have had hepatitis C. So actually it's quite possible because of this perverse incentive that all this guidance didn't actually slow down the amount of hepatitis C much at all. So uh, that for me was a fantastic lesson in the fact that statisticians looking at the data, we, we can't do this without talking to people about how the data was collected. It's really powerful, really, my God, I never thought about that. There's a good reason for, oh, to go along, to get, to try to give blood. So we concluded that 27,000 people had got infected with hepatitis C with a huge uncertainty, 21,000 to 38,000 estimated. All done through this, we did a you know Monte Carlo analysis or probabilistic modeling and things which I don't have to go into. Essentially it's a big spreadsheet, but with uncertainty on all the links. That's really all it is. But in the end, we ended up that about, we thought about 1800 people had died by 2019 because they would got hepatitis C from a blood transfusion. And we don't know who they are. These are statistical lies. We don't know who they are.
Um, so rather not a registry. We had moderate confidence. Yeah, even that's a, yeah, because we'd made so many assumptions in particular about this effect of the um, of the uh, guidance. So, OK, let's go back again. That was what, what we're doing on hepatitis. We still haven't finished because then they are. They just came back to us uh, and said, OK, how many people died altogether from all these all these different things? Which is, and so we're still doing the sums, hasn't come out yet on how many, putting all this together with all our uncertainties, how many do, people do we think in the end it killed? And, it, and the point is that this is the number, the headline number that's going to get all the publicity. Well, they've had a lot of publicity already. Like, one thing I should say is that we had to give evidence in a court setting with a QC asking us, there were the families of the people who had died. Every inquiry I've given evidence at in the front row are all the families. So you're sitting there as an expert and we've actually now got a pretty well scripted statement that we make at the beginning saying that we apologize in advance that as statisticians we are talking about numbers. You know we are adding up numbers of people who have died. This might sound harsh and cold. Really we recognize that these are all individuals all with their tragic stories. However, it's only by aggregating all these stories together that we can get an image of the magnitude of what's happened. So we've got a really a prepared script which which we realize you have to do. OK, let's go back 20 years, 25 years. Remember this one? The ba Bristol babies. Um, I was involved in the General Medical Council um, uh, uh, based on 29 children who had died um, from Bristol. Uh, it's James Wishart. And then um, we then uh, were asked to give to form the statistical team for the public inquiry. This public inquiry that was held in Bristol, headed by Ian Kennedy. Again, there's a, with a great gang of us, multiple sources of data. We had six, oh God, what they, seven different data sets about babies getting heart babies with congenital heart disease getting surgery in Bristol they all said different things they're all collected in different ways they all came up with different numbers none of them were right so we had to say that none of these data right. we've got to make a judgment we've got to look at there were two main ones the there was a cardiac surgical register and hospital episode statistics but they they came up with different counts they defined operations in different ways absolute nightmare complete mess um that was the team. Looks like something out of Reservoir Dogs, doesn't it? Anyway, there we all are. And it looks terrifying. But again, we were giving evidence. Families in the front row went on, got on news. We, I think we were the lead item on News at 10 at one point. So there's the sort of plots we produced that we had to explain to the families. OK, so this is the cardiac surgical register. This is hospital episode statistics. This is supposed to be the same data, but but actually it's not quite the same. These are the 12 hospitals doing um, congenital surgery on babies with congenital heart disease under one years old. And this is 1991 to 1995, over a five year period. And uh, what these is, the average mortality was 12 percent. It's 2 percent now. Can you believe that? In 30 years, the mortality rate has gone from 12% to 2%. This is a staggering achievement. No, and I think some of that can be put down to the fact that the scrutiny that centres have received, it's still, this data is still publicly available on the, on the website. It's still publicly available. The mortality rate of the, all the hospitals doing it. But you can see, well, there's, the dot is the, is the actual mortality rate. And the, this is the sort of interval, the uncertainty around it. And you can see, that on number 11, uh, I think is the biggest, that's Great Ormond Street, which has got lower mortality there, lower mortality than normal. The one at the top is Bristol. Look at that, you know, with a, it's a really sticks out like a, a sore thumb. It was quite obvious. You don't need, didn't need fancy statistical analysis to spot that particularly, although we did a lot of fancy statistical analysis because they asked us in what operations and things like that. Then somebody suggested, I didn't think of this, plot the mortality rate against the number of operate, number of cases per year. I didn't think of it. You don't see it from that. There's a picture, you can look at that graph and it doesn't tell you, but if you do it, you, if you think of plotting the right numbers, suddenly, what do you do? you can see a, a complete pattern. The bigger, the ones that do more have got lower mortality rates. Everybody that does more than um, you know, one a month, what's that, 12 a year? Yeah, 
has lower than average mortality, right? And everyone who did less has got higher. And that's without, Bristol is the sore thumb, though. that's without taking into account Bristol. That, that line, that regression line is fitted without Bristol. Bristol's so obvious. So even, this caused a lot of fuss with, with appeals to close the small centres and so on. Actually, the smaller centres now have got a lot. There's, this has pretty well disappeared now through you know, enormous scrutiny and effort and stopping this general surgeon idea. People used to be adult cardiac surgeons and do a little children's surgery on the side. These babies have hearts the size of a walnut. This is a specialist thing. So these small centers got specialist surgeons. So that was a, a very powerful sign um, that, that we did. And again, it's through choosing the right thing to do. And I didn't think of it immediately. This is a complicated graph, but I wanted to show it because it's one of these graphs that just shows up something. Again, by thinking of plotting the right thing, suddenly you get a picture. This is how many, the age and months at which babies got their surgery. And look at this pile here. This is Bristol here. They all got operated on, not all, but hugely just before their first birthday. Why? Because regional, because funding depending, depended and recognition as a regional center depended on doing the surgery for the baby was one. And so they squeezed them in just before their first birthday. When they were too old for the surgery, they should have had it earlier. So this is the why the, the um, I mean, it's again, wouldn't you have to think of plotting month, month of surgery and suddenly this pattern hits you. No, in the other hospitals, not at all. Bristol, it was the whole organization at Bristol that was wrong. So this is not the fault of the surgeons. This is the fault of the cardiologists for not getting, moving people through, getting them in younger. So it, it is, it's quite extraordinary. Again, I'll show you another one in a moment that's even better. All these are to do with plotting graphs where you actually don't need very fancy analysis. Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. Oh, anyway, bah, 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 blah, 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 blah. Yeah, basically it's a systemic problem. It's almost unfair that the, there were three surgeons, two surgeons and the medical director in the court because this was a systemic problem. Okay. This is the family in the front row. So it's quite tough giving this giving this evidence um, because it looks really harsh. And these we all these babies have got names and we knew the names. Also in 1998, his Shipman. Drag, you can remember Shipman. If you well, think there's some young people here, they might know. But this was extraordinary because, you know, he said he had nothing to hide. You know, he murdered at least 215 people and it looks like a lot more than that. Um, so there's a map of Hyde. Remember the broad, you've never seen the map of the Broad Street pump that John Snow had showing the cholera cases, identifying the source of the cholera. Well, we should be able to spot with this where Shipman's practice was. It was in Market Street, just there. Quite extraordinary. Um, and we were called to give evidence to the Shipman inquiry after he had been caught. And this is the sort of data that, I mean, this is so appalling, it's untrue. These are the individual cases just in the last six weeks before he was caught. And you can just see that very few of his, the deaths of his patients were natural. Um, really, really quite shocking. Um, we produced various graphs, which in this looks like quite a complicated graph, but there's a lot of information here. So basically it shows the year of his victims and the age of the victim as a scatter with the sort of with the distributions shown on the margins. So what do you see there? What's um okay? Who does he kill more, men or women? Women. Can you see a change in the pattern of the age of the people he killed? They got younger. Yeah, they were in their forty, but it's because it's thought he started off with people who actually looked like they were fairly terminally ill, but after a while he just he really broadened out. Any other distinctive picture there, pattern there? Forensics. Yes, yeah. Look, he was murdering one every two weeks just before he was caught. Why did he stop? Why did he stop? That's again, just do the plot and suddenly something comes up that demands a more, more of a question. Why did he stop? He was, all this time, he was um, working in a joint practice. And then he thought, it was thought that he thought he might be being suspected. So he left the joint practice and set up as a single-handed practice. And that meant, oopsie, that meant that he could um, actually carry on. 
as he wanted, because no one was looking at, looking over his shoulder. Now, again, I keep on emphasizing this because it, it's something I, I, I suppose under, you've got to ask the right questions, and so go and find the right information. And um, there was an inquiry, a, 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 a professor of general practice it was instigated with doing an investigation of, of Shipman, and he thought of going to the cremation certificates, which have got a lot of information on them, to look at the cremation certificates that Shipman had signed. One of the things that's on the cremation certificates is the time of death, which isn't on the death certificates. So time of death is on the cremation certificates. He went through all Shipman's cremation certificates and all the ones of all the local GPs as well, and recorded all this data. When you plot the time of death of other GPs around Shipman, that's the pattern. It's uniform, really. People die at all times of the day and night. There's no, no effect at all. And when you plot Shipman's patients, that's what it looks like. I think that's the most chilling graph I've ever seen. They all pretty well all die between two and three in the afternoon. And he recorded it. I and mean, if anyone had looked at that data, thought of looking at it, it would just hit them immediately. So what's known as, you know, interocular effect. It hits you between the eyes immediately. You don't need to do fancy analysis. So why do they all die between two and three in the afternoon? House calls. He did home visits, you know, and then you'd say, um, you know, when, when people were at home on their own and their families were out, well, they lived on their own, and you'd say, oh, just, I'll give you something to make you more comfortable. Give a huge dimorphine overdose, heroin overdose, essentially and they would die very calmly in front of his eyes. So he did that again and again and again and again. He actually killed four people in his surgery, which is staggering. So that's, again, a huge, you don't need much fancy forensic statistics for that. But then we were asked, when could he have been caught? Now, we, uh, well, we agreed to try to answer that. The infected blood inquiry wanted to ask us, when could they have known about this? And we refused to do that. We just would say how many were infected. We didn't want to go into when could possibly someone had, had to, could have done something about it. But this we thought we'd have a go. When could he have been caught if somebody had been looking at the data? Now, what we couldn't answer that, we could have said, but we did, we could say, when could it have been identified as being odd? Because we wouldn't have known whether it was caught or not or stopped, what would have happened. But when could it be identified as being odd? And the natural thing then is to look at, essentially count his deaths and compare it with how many you would have expected if he had been normal. Standard observed minus expected excess deaths. And you've heard about that all through COVID. Excess deaths is just, you know, to use the phrase, counting the bodies, counting the deaths and subtracting from it how many you would have expected anyway in a normal general, you know, because people, people do die and you allow for the age and the sex of the patient. And what you see is that for both the men and women, the excess grows steadily, 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 until by 1998 when he got caught, it was at about 190 for women, about 50 for men, which matches almost exactly what the inquiry concluded of the people he'd murdered. So this simple statistical calculation, which knows nothing about the patients, the individuals, purely based on a statistical analysis, estimates almost precisely how many people he killed, which is an extraordinary bit of forensic stats. Now, when would you blow the whistle? If you were looking at this data, you know, would you say, when would you say, is it here? Here, would you have to wait till here before it looked odd enough? When do you blow the whistle? And it's complicated statistically because if you keep on every year comparing, we know mathematically that even if he's completely normal at some point, it'll look strange just because of random variability. And there's 26,000 GPs in the country. So you're going to be blowing the whistle right, left and center every week, every year. A whole lot will be investigated and everything. No, it's pretty disastrous. So you need some sophisticated methodology. Right now, stats, maths. I do hope you come from maths lecture. I know some of you will have been very frustrated because there have not been any math so far. So here we go. Those of you who might want to just pause for a moment. I'm going to do a little diversion to 2000. Now, fast forward 2021. Okay, let's start on some stats. Um, let's remember 2021, we were all 
you know, lateral flow tests, and stuffing those things up our noses and looking at the, watching for that magic bar. You know, is it going to get that bar? You know, oh, God, I remember that. I remember doing, I remember doing a talk. I, just, I was supposed to be live, but I was online because I tested positive. And, um, and I, I really wanted really black, solid lines. Yeah, woo, yeah I, I really had it. And so uh, I was giving this talk online on Zoom. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it, but I've tested positive with COVID. Have a look at this. And they said, whoa, they said, I went like that. <laughs> and they all struck back. Like, you can't get it over Zoom. Don't panic, don't panic. Anyway, that's by the way. So um, the, the, the estimate at the time was, it would, you know, they're not fantastic, but if you're infected, it would get about 50% of the time because it doesn't pick you, it doesn't pick you up um, at the end, at the very beginning, and at the, particularly at the end of the infection where probably you wouldn't infect anybody anyway, but when there's a low viral load. But, and the, but the false positive rate is really low. Only one in a thousand people who didn't have COVID, you know, would be, or wouldn't infected, would test positive. So a very low false positive rate, if we, let's define that as a false positive rate. So at the time when we did this analysis, about one in 300 school students were infected. Not that many, so this is quite a low prevalence, about 0.3%. If a student gets a positive test, Zephyr is sent home, and then not only he gets sent home, but his whole gang got sent home, what's the chance they really have the infection? Okay. So 90, the false positive rate, one in a thousand. What's the chance they really have the infection? Is it 99.9%, 99%, 60%, or 50%? A, B, C, or D, that they really are infected. Nah, any, I won't, I won't, I won't do a poll, I don't think, but any offers, any offers, what does anyone think? Who think, well, okay, anyone think A, 99.9%? Really dead? No, I won't, I won't ask you to put your hands up. Come on, offers, sorry? D, 50%. Ah, why do you think it's only 50%? 50% is sensitivity of 50%. Yeah, no. <laughs> right, yes? The false positive rate, not the false discovery rate. FPR. So that's the, yeah, that's why I hate the term false positive rate. Awful. But you know, you hear politicians, God, they never got it right. Because it's the chance of testing positive if you are truly negative. It's not the chance of being negative if you test positive. That's the opposite. That's the whole point of my talk. Okay, okay, let's do the sums. Yeah, always the way to do these sums is to think, what does it mean for 100,000 people or 100 people? But for these numbers, you have to use about a, about a million people. A million school kids, because a million school kids were testing all the time. A million school kids, 3,000 will have the disease only, 0.3%. 997,000 won't. Those 3,000, you'll get 1,500 of them will test positive, 50% of them false positive. But out of these, one in a thousand will test positive. That's 997 will test positive. So there's about 2,500 tests of whom only 1,500 are truly positive. So it's, uh, is that any of the answers? It's 1,500 over 25, what's that? Yeah, 60%, 60%, 60%, 60%, C, who got C? Go on, put your hands up, C. Yeah, here's C, that's it, I knew it was 60%. So although the false positive rate is, is one in a thousand, if someone tests positive, it's only just more likely than not that they're actually positive. This means that vast numbers of kids were being sent home for no reason. Um, so this sort of reasoning is really quite tricky. It's unintuitive. It's called, you know, by really it's a form of Bayes' theorem. So, so if someone tests positive, there's only 60% chance they're truly infected, even though the so, so, so this is the only way I think really to do these sums, even though the false positive rate is one of the things. Okay, this is the this is the mathematical version of that, and it's using Bayes the idea of Bayes theorem, and it says that the prior odds of having COVID, which was three over nine nine seven, so roughly one in three hundred, you multiply it by the likelihood ratio, which is the probability of a positive test given you got COVID or infected divided by the probability of positive test if you haven't got COVID. Remember, it's 50% if you've got it and 0.1% if you haven't. So that's a likelihood ratio of 500. 
That's the crucial thing, 500. Remember the number 500. So this is quite a strong test. It's a pretty good test. But because it, the thing is so rare, when you multiply these together, you still only get that the odds of having a bit, actually having COVID is three to two, 60%. So it's quite a strong test. It multiplies the odds that you odds of you um, having COVID by 500. But if it's very low to start with, it's still not very high at the end. And this is so unintuitive, it's really difficult reasoning. But this was the point about it is this likelihood ratio is the crucial term. So uh, moral, if you think you found a needle in the haystack, your confidence should depend on how many needles were there in the first place. In other words, how common the virus is is incredibly important. Those prior odds are absolutely vital. So the prosecutor's fallacy is to confuse these two numbers that we've been looking at. Prosecutor's fallacies is to confuse the probability of a positive test if you're not infected, which is one in a thousand, with the probability of being not infected with a positive test, which is 40%, 400 times as much. These numbers are totally different. And, but, and you'd say, well, those, obviously you can't confuse those two. It's known as the law of the transpose conditional. It simply means the probability of A given B is being confused by the probability of B given A. Surely nobody could do that. It's like saying, you know, if you've got a dog, you've probably got four legs. It's not the same as if you've got four legs, you're probably a dog. And we can, I think we can just about tell the difference between those two. However, in court, these often get confused. It's quite extraordinary because likelihood ratios are the currency of forensic sciences, of evaluative forensic science. They are the nuts and bolts, the currency. They're the one values that are used in court in order to decide the strength of evidence, the, the weight we should place on forensics, forensic evidence. And though in a court, you'd be saying the likelihood ratio is the probability of the evidence if the, in a criminal court, in a, if the prosecution claim was true, their, their proposition, divided by the probability of the evidence if the defense claim was true. So it's how much more the evidence supports the prosecution than it does the defense. So, you know, it's a very reasonable thing to ask. And this is the thing you, people, you want to try to put numbers on in order to judge how much weight you can give to the evidence. So if you've got DNA, it's the probability of getting a DNA match if the suspect was present, which is we typically think might be near one, divided by the probability of the DNA match if he wasn't there and it was just somebody, some other person. And that's generally known as the random match probability, the thing at the bottom, probably of getting a DNA match just by chance alone. So uh, that's the random match probability, which, which might could run into hundreds of millions, billions, billions, depending on how good the match is. But the prosecutor's fallacy in court, for example, would be the probability of a match if the semen came from another person is one in a billion, and that's quite correct. When that gets confused, either in the telling, but by the interpretation, is the probability that the semen came from another person is one in a billion which is completely wrong, totally wrong. And they do get confused. And I should have I should have picked out some examples of some judgments where the, it's just the Barry George case is full up with this stuff. Really terrible. Um, so this is a su suggested verbal equivalence of bands of like well, the, 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 lot, the lateral flow test of the likelihood ratio of 500. Therefore, getting a lateral flow test officially would be con considered as moderately strong support that you got COVID which I think is not a bad interpretation for that. Above a thousand, it gets to strong support. So this is this is the recommended interpretation of likelihood ratios. If you do use this interpretation, the benefit, the value of that partly is also, it doesn't mean the likelihood ratio has to be too, too precise because likelihood ratios are always dependent on assumptions and some may be better than others. So here's a recent case, not a criminal case, but in 2012, archeologists started digging in a car park in Leicester. In a few hours, on the first day of digging, at the first trench, they found their first skeleton. There it was. And they said, that's Richard III. The very first thing they found on the first day, that's Richard III. And, um, and possibly it was. You can actually see the curvature of the spine right there. So that's what they claimed. So then, this was later claimed to be Richard. They didn't see that straight away, although I bet they thought it. There's a lovely article doing a forensic or statistical analysis of Richard III, as if this was a criminal case. Is this Richard III or not? Looking at the likelihood ratios for the different aspects of the skeleton. 
And um, this is really nice because they could do radiocarbon data and then they produced in the paper, it's lovely, a reasoning behind all these likelihood ratios, what, what, the, what the relative support was for the, that it's Richard III against not being Richard III. The radiocarbon dating was very weak evidence indeed, because everyone in that church I was buried around the same time. Not everyone, lots of people. So that's actually really quite, the date is quite a weak evidence. The age and sex of the skeleton, again, it's not quite a common one. And how they got these was to look at all the records for everybody being dug up essentially look at the databases because they had a database and they could estimate actually how many people in the 15th century had scoliosis had curvature of the spine from these burial records so that's pretty strong evidence 212 there's the the strongest one was mitochondrial dna match through the female line um with a 500 moderately strong um support the y chromosome not matching was evidence against him but as they judge that there's there's be gaps due to disputed paternity over the last 600 years we can't believe paternal um, uh, um ancestry now those are all assessed separately then they do something which officially by Bayes' theorem you're allowed to do which is multiply them all up together and they get six and a half million overwhelming evidence so it's richard the third he's got got the burial in leicester cathedral six and a half million to one they conclude as as the um, likely ratio. So that overwhelms any perhaps prior odds about it being Richard III. Okay, so we we produced use this example in fact in the primer that um, we wrote with with Neve was was in charge of this project. Um, love, you know, I think it's it's not bad, was it? A lot of work, a lot of work. Even Neve, her team, with fantastic amount of work. But the further for the main draft of it, um, I was really I put a lot of into it. But it was what well, the great thing was is that the collaborator on this was was David Kitchen, Lord Kitchen, Supreme Court Judge. Supreme Court has got a really serious scientist. He did natural sciences at Cambridge, so you've got somebody who really understands the maths and the data and the science, which is extraordinary to have someone like that on Supreme Court. Um, now, you notice what notice the Bayes theorem allows you to multiply those things up. You're not allowed to do that in court. And you're not allowed to use the prior probability. In the Court of Appeal has ruled that Bayes theorem should not be used by a jury to combine and weigh evidence. Likelihood ratios assessed by experts are permitted if they have the same basis. But you can't, it's considered as the do it, taking the job of the jury if you go through that full analysis like we did for Richard III or the lateral flow test. So you can quote the likelihood ratios and give them their verbal interpretation and talk about your confidence, the, well, the basis and how, how you've arrived at them. But um, currently from the Court of Appeal judgment, you can't do the work to produce a probability of guilt or multiply them up together. Now, OK. Still trying to, this is all a diversion from Shipman. Remember, I'll take you back, you may have forgotten, but we we're trying to work out when Shipman could have been caught. It is, this is related, this is related. Back to Bletchley Park in 1941, dotting around in history rather. There he is, Alan Turing, was break, his group was breaking the Enigma codes. He had built this machine, the bomb, clack, 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 clack. You might have seen the imitation in the film, you've seen going clack, 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 clack. They had to find starting points to set what set the rotors at. They, they, couldn't try all the options. They just didn't have time. The Germans who built the Enigma codes didn't think they were unbreakable. They just thought they were practically unbreakable, that no one could do it fast enough to be of interest. They didn't think they were unbreakable. They just thought nobody could actually practically do it. So what he did was actually have women, they had these bambarisms, these punch cards, and they'd take a two messages and put them in, in holes like that and then m physically move them backwards and forwards to see where they where there was matches at a certain um, distance away because that suggested that if those were the same if there was a match it suggested there was the same word being used German word and they had the same same rotor settings it increases the chance that these two messages are the same rotor settings because there'd be a match if it was the same word so that was would be fantastic information so they had all these women sort of moving these things up and down and then they had to work out, well, it's not, it's not definite. He knew that he should be multiplying likelihood ratios. For the two hypotheses, they've got the same settings, the messages of different settings. And so he knew he should be multiplying likelihood ratios. Couldn't he? We wanted to do something that people could do in their heads. People would just do use pieces of paper to do the added. So he took logarithms of the likelihood ratios, multiplied them by 20 
to turn them into whole numbers. Call this the weight of evidence. This could be done by hand. So he developed all of this in 1941, 1942. Extraordinary work. And then wasn't allowed to tell anyone about it. We found out about it in 2012. 70 years GCHQ sat on his paper. Actually, we knew we did know quite a lot about it, but we didn't see his actual report on it till 2012. 70 years, they said. They said, we've wrung it dry now. We're going to let it put it out in the public. Um, so there, there it was, came in 2012. And it really describes beautifully how he used likelihood ratios in order to break the Enigma codes. But they added the likelihood ratios, just like for the, um, added the log likelihood ratios, just like we multiplied them for the, um, uh, for Shipman. No, no, not for Shipman. Where were you? No, who were for Richard III, dotting around in history rather, <laughs> historically. We're back to Shipman. Okay. The point is that people were, were, did the work of trying to work out when to blow the whistle, again, in the Second World War. They didn't know anything about what Turing was doing, but they reinvented the idea of using cumulative log likelihood ratios to compare two hypotheses in the Second World War. Um, and uh, they need a sequential, the probability of so many deaths of shipment at twice the normal death rate, divided by the probability of so many deaths of shipment at normal death rate, cumulative sums of log likelihood ratios. This is known as the risk adjusted sequential probability test developed in 1944, 1943 and 1944, and we applied it to shipment. And it worked. Well, it worked. We concluded that he could have been definitely identified as being odd in 1985 after he killed only 40 people. And he really would have stuck out. The alpha and beta are the two types of error you can make. You can falsely accuse someone of being odd, or you can miss somebody who's odd. Those two, we wanted to keep those error rates very low, at one in 100,000. Still, with those error rates very low, at one in 100, you could have found them in 1985. If someone had been looking at the data, but nobody was. And that's what we had to say to the families in the front row. Yes, he could have been caught. Nobody was looking at the data. So that was, that was quite tough. Then what was interesting is my colleagues then tried out this system on a thousand GPs around the country without telling them. And it's just as well they didn't tell them because five came out as worse than shipment. They would have gone ping before shipment. Why would they have gone ping? What sort of GPs were they? Yes. These were really nice, caring GPs. Eastbourne, with a lot of, they were looking after hospices. They were helping people to die at home, providing home care, a lot of palliative care, signing large numbers of death certificates. Looking after hospices were in their, in their patch. So these are some of the best GPs in the country, which went ping before shipment. So that is my example of correlation is not causation. You can, dis you can build a statistical system, a forensic statistical system, to say when something's strange, you cannot say why it's strange. And it would be disastrous to have something like this operating publicly. It has to be operated behind the scenes. For, and it just says a human should look at this. This is odd. I can't say why it's odd. OK, so I'm going to finish now. Sorry, I'm rambling. It's a nice audience. I don't want to ramble. So okay. <laughs> conclusions, COVID is a challenging job. Uh, need close collaborations between statisticians and lawyers to improve the communication uncertainty. Probative value of evidence can be put into possibly rough numbers, but I think we need to communicate the limitations in the assessment. I quite like confidence statements. And you need training of legal professionals in forensic statistics. And a MOOC is on the way, which we've been designing, which is great. So just to finish off about rules, COVID rules. Yeah, COVID rules were tr quite tricky. Do I remember back in 2020, uh, I was on the Today programme, I said raised voices could spread the virus, which they, which they can, and that singing may be bad. You know, maybe that's going to be a new rule. And in fact, we did our choir with masks outdoors, two meters apart. Oh, it was ridiculous. Anyway, what well, we did it, we thought. So I was feeling a bit mischievous. So I said, it might be a good idea to ban family arguments. You know, imagine around the Christmas dinner table, unventilated room, all shouting at each other like you do. And, uh, you know, super spreader events. These are really dangerous. Uh, this was a joke. However, by an hour later in the express, we had Christmas warning. Families could be banned from arguing to prevent COVID spread, according to a leading British statistician. Yay, yay. So I think I am responsible for a piece of delightful misinformation. 
which I'm quite proud of. Thank you very much indeed. And I apologise for going on. Um, thank you very much indeed, David. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and for such a fascinating lecture. I don't know which parts of it I would like to ask you about. Um, did ramble we're, a bit. We're, we're going to have some time um, for some questions and I'm aware also that we have a large audience um, online. So we're going to take a number of questions. David will be outside having a well-earned glass of wine afterwards if you want to um, corner him to ask yeah. something else. But is there any question to start off with here in the audience? Blair. I understand. I suppose it's just suits very well. We're going to understand it, but there you explained it well. In a sense, putting it into context, did it matter that it, the actual probability of somebody being positive was as low as that? If we made sure we caught the majority of people who were positive and they didn't make it for it, yeah, yeah, but there was also a big cost of false positives. There were huge numbers of people's kids sent home. And in fact, it wasn't until 2021, later in 2021, that actually did a randomized trial of school in schools. So finally evaluated whether you had to send the kid and all their, their group home. And they did a randomized trials with 100 schools of one policy, 100 schools, and they found out you didn't have to. It made no difference sending everyone home. You just had to send the kid home. And you just had to monitor the others. So for a year, all these kids were being sent home for no reason. And I think it, when we think of the harm that the pandemic has done to kids and their education, I think there is a big cost to false positives in that, in that way. Yeah. Mike. Oh, yeah, hugely, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this is the function of prevalence. That, the, the statements there is when it's quite rare, um, when there's high prevalence. Well, it's pretty well, you know, you can just guess that so many people have got it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether, I mean, presumably the inquiry is going to go into all this at some point. My, my problem is not that at the beginning they were doing really stringent measures like this. I think it's quite reasonable but in to early 2020 when you didn't know much. My real problem is that they didn't make any attempt to actually experimentally evaluate what was what was the better policy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, please. No, come on, Neve, you've got to answer this. Well, I think the MOOC is designed to be used at many different levels, both as professional development, continuing professional development. We've done courses for judges. I do judi judicial courses. Um, the plan in Northumbria is to bring it in at undergraduate level, I think. Um, it's to bring it in at level for both undergraduate, but also for barristers and barrister yeah, training. That's it, barrister training in particular, because it's the use of this argument and what is reasonable to, to be able to say and not say, and what questions to ask, what questions to ask of your expert as well. So it's, it, it can go in at many different levels, you know, the different, um, yeah, you know, the, that, that familiarity should be there. But I think to get it in early on, to realise that, you know, forensic analysis, you know, you know, over a wide range of, in a way, what you might call classical forensic problems, but also these more statistical ones, so perhaps a bit more innovative is really important. It's going to be increasingly important as well. So the, the MOOC is a collaboration between um, David's Centre in Cambridge, um, the Law School in Northumbria and ourselves here in Dundee. I'll take one more on there, then we have one online. Yeah. Yep. 
Absolutely. And some do. I mean, if you do a meta analysis using the grade system, you get a confidence, you get a star rating on your whole analysis. You get an estimate and an interval, and then you get a star rating as to how much you believe it. So this is absolutely standard in medical work. Already it's been for, going for years. It's absolutely standard in climate change work. You, you build a model, you do some analysis, and you produce a, 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 some conclusion, and then you put a confidence on it. It's standard in intelligence work, that you have a confidence rating in your intelligence assessment. It's standard in, you know, it'd be, all the SAGE advice came with a confidence rating. People can do it, and it's very helpful. It's a qualitative measure, but it basically says, you know, how confident are you that you've been asked a question you're trying to answer? How confident are you that the, the evidence you've got can actually answer the question? You can have a go, but the point is that, and you can do all sorts of statistical analysis, but you calculated intervals are always too narrow because they're all modeled based on assumptions. This, in fact, is kind of saying, well, how plausible the assumptions are that I've been using. It's stepping back. It requires humility and it requires some, some confidence that um, the audience is going to be sensitive to this and treat it appropriately. But it is completely standard in medicine now. I mean, you can call it star rating. I, like, I quite like to call it star rating. It's a one star analysis or up to a five star analysis. Yet, no. We have one question online, which goes Heather. Yeah, we've got a question um, from Carlotta. Could you please explain the impact of the example you gave for the prosecutor fallacy regarding the DNA semen source? It says, thank you for an amazing talk. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, that was uh, that was just an example. Uh, that's one in primer we used an example. Um, was that from a particular, uh, that is from a particular trial, I think. I don't remember. I can't remember. And I should have used some specific words, but it is common and it can be very misleading to the jury. Uh, we know how, how this, we know how um, Roy Meadows, you know, uh, evidence in the in the Sally Clark trial was hugely misinterpreted. As I said, the Barry George transcript, Barry George, even the judgment, but apparently what was said in court, it's even worse in terms of how it's used. So it's so easy to slip up in the language. You've got a one in a million likelihood ratio or something. Like that. It's so easy to sound like it's a million to one that, you know, he did it or didn't do it. It's so easy to do. You would think, you know, my dog example, you know, is, oh, who could make that mistake? But it's very easy to do. People do it all the time. And, and that false positive rate, you know, endlessly people call mistake what a false positive rate is. Very last one, Chris. I'll talk afterwards. <laughs> well, I think the problem with the, with the GPT is does not have a confidence rating. There's no expression. Everything is delivered with absolute confidence, whether it's completely spurious or not. So it's got no idea of, of what it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And which is disastrous, I think, or it could be very dangerous. So it has to be monitored all the time by people who know better than it, essentially. So it can do middle ranking stuff, but there's got to be someone who knows more than it in order to check everything it does. In our, our sort of um, decision support systems we got for people with breast, prostate cancer and breast cancer, we absolutely, everything is given with a probability. Everything, everything's given with, a, with, a, uh, with a, some humility about this case is a bit odd. Take, you know, don't, you know, be, care, be careful here. It doesn't know what it doesn't know. And this is an enormous retrograde step in terms of decision support systems. So I think GPT is absolutely brilliant what it can do. GPT-4, I mean, it's quite extraordinary, but it's big, it has no idea. It doesn't know what it doesn't know. And on that note, <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a, a fantastic lecture tonight. Um, it remains for me to thank a few people, uh, in particular to thank um, um, David what's for name? what's his name <laughs> um, for um, such a, a wonderful lecture and for giving us um, his time. So I'd ask you to do that, please, in the All ordinary. Right, there are also a few other people um, that I also want to thank. Um, our principal, um, Professor 
Ian Gillespie for um, doing the introduction this evening. Um, thank you very much, Ian, for your time. And then also um, the Leverhulme team, uh, Heather Doran, Clara Morris, Marge Davies for doing all of the back of house organising um, to get us here today and for you to be able to enjoy the refreshments in just a moment. Uh, you've all been given a little evaluation form. It'd be delightful if you could fill that out, please, and give it back to um, Heather um, here or they, Heather will, will arrange to collect it. For those of you online, we haven't forgotten you. Thank you for giving us your time this evening and there'll also be a means whereby you can feed back to us um, with respect to what you thought of the lecture and what you might like us to present to you in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your attention. There's some refreshments for you outside and enjoy the rest of your evening.